If you've got ADHD and you want to know how to approach your employer to speak about reasonable adjustments and how to address the ADHD medication shortage with them, these are the questions I ask ADHD employment lawyer Jody Hill in today's episode. Watching the numbers go up really helps me avoid burnout and keeps me motivated to make amazing content for you all. So if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. And if you're listening to this on a podcast app, please hit the follow button. Thank you so much and enjoy the episode. Jodie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Just to set the scene, um, when were you diagnosed and what happened that made you want to seek assessment? So it was after the first lockdown, actually, no, during the first lockdown, I think, the August 2020. Mm. So what happened was in the lockdowns, we had to stop all of our extracurricular. So stop moving around, traveling around, couldn't really be outside. And what I realized was my body just didn't want to do that. And my mind was still going literally a million miles an hour <laughs> thinking, oh my God, what's going on? I mm. thought, I actually thought that at times I was losing my mind because my brain just felt like it was going really fast. And obviously my body was having to slow down because mm. that was the world that we lived in. Um, and at the time I wasn't struggling with anxiety, which is what I'd been treated for before. So I had anxiety, insomnia and PTSD. And off the back of that, I'd had quite a lot of treatment and therapy. And so I suppose I've got quite a good awareness of whether I'm managing that well. And actually, despite the pandemic, I was actually managing that really well. So I was like, well, it's not that. So what is it? Mm. Um, so I just took the view that actually I needed to speak to someone because I was getting it in, in my head a little bit too much. And so I went through a private diagnosis because I couldn't get an appointment for, oh God, it's how long, like two years or something. And I was really fortunate I was able to get one on Zoom because mm. they weren't doing them on Zoom before. Um, and that, yeah, so went through that process and I was co uh, diagnosed with combined, so in inattentive and hyperactive. When, when you got that diagnosis, how did, how did you feel? Um, I suppose I wasn't wholly surprised. Um, I certainly have had people say to me, I think you've got ADHD before, mm. especially people who are, um, who have already been diagnosed or who treat in that area. But equally, I felt, I felt quite relieved because I, for me, it was worrying about, well, what is it? Mm. Um, and I suppose, I mean, because I, I, I've got some friends who've really struggled with the process and also the actual diagnosis. And for me, actually, I found it was quite a relief um, because I kind of knew who I was. Mm. So it was quite a positive experience for me. And the medication process that led from that was also quite positive in the sense of I found one straight away that worked and I, I had the support, albeit it was terribly expensive because I had to do it through, through the private mm. process. But I felt as though the process for me was actually really positive. So the medication for you, did that really help alleviate the anxiety and the other negative traits? So I, I, so how I, how I started with the meds is I started on like a 20 milligram and then gradually moved it up. And I remember going to my psychiatrist and going, am I supposed to feel anything? What am I supposed to feel? Because you had to write a diary. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking, you know, when you've had anxiety medication, you feel different. You do feel different. And, and the only way I could describe it when I had anxiety medication was I did feel a bit emotionally numb at times. And I suppose that was my main concern. Like I didn't want to go back on medication that would make me feel like that. Um, so yeah, I think building that up over time allowed me to kind of see the impact. Mm. Um, and that's why you have to do it in that way. So it's safe with a, with a psychiatrist. But it did, it did alleviate the symptoms. And then some days it doesn't alleviate any. So, you know, most of the time it does alleviate them. But I'd say probably like 60 to 70% of the symptoms are alleviated. But it's not like a, you can't just draw a line and go, okay, so today I'm just not going to forget stuff. Mm. Like there, it's a little bit more it's a bit more nuanced than that but you do notice a difference and uh, the last two days I haven't had my medication and I did notice a big difference in my energy levels was really exhausted mm. and just my ability to make decisions was a little bit slower and things like that as well so yeah it's definitely it's definitely helped me um and I I, I can't imagine not having it now actually mm. have you been affected by the the recent shortage yeah, so I'm on 70 milligrams, which is sort of the highest dosage. And so it, I suppose, makes it harder to get it as well because it's not like you can get necessarily the lowest dosage and just carry on with that. Mm. But yeah, there have been real struggles. Fortunately, I've managed to find a lower dosage today, actually today, uh, which has been, which has really relieved me. But I, mm. I was actually really overwhelmed at the weekend of right. the prospect of like not actually having the medication and not knowing when we'd get it again. And I suppose part of the reason for that was it took so long to get, to that point, like it took several months to, mm. to, to 
build it up. So if you can't get an appointment with a psychiatrist, how do you do that? It was, it was I suppose, the unknown and kind of going, mm. well, well, what does this mean? You know, I'm now in a, in a place where I can actually be myself and, and function at a quite a high level. So the thought of kind of going back to how it was before is mm. quite scary. When you look back into your earlier years with the knowledge around ADHD that you have now, can you see ADHD showing up when you were a child? I can, but I think I masked a lot when I was younger. So until the diagnosis, I don't really think I was um, really being myself, I'd mm. say. Definitely, after, I had a breakdown a couple of years ago, a mental breakdown, and, and that actually, in hindsight, is probably linked to the burnout from ADHD, but I wasn't diagnosed then, so it was treated as anxiety and PTSD. And off the back of that, I've really, I suppose I've kind of grown and, and, and understood like where I'm going and what like what's happening mm. with with the various conditions but it is yeah it's, it is it's just it's, it's it's challenging to kind of balance those things when you have a i've never had one so i can't what does what does a mental if you're happy to share yeah, what does a course. mental breakdown look like so for me i was diagnosed with the the mental health conditions that i mentioned before the anxiety and the, the ptsd and um, what happened was i was in an environment that wasn't a supportive environment mm. I also had a number of different life issues so the the symptoms were exacerbated so despite being on high levels of medication and in therapy i just wasn't able to cope anymore and what i found was actually i didn't want to i stopped wanting to socialize i didn't want to go out mm. didn't want to be around people i stopped doing things that helped me like my self-care my exercise and I really became a social recluse and quite an outgoing person so I didn't notice any of these behaviors mm. and what then happened was I ended up leaving my job as a solicitor which I'd worked my whole life to become I was like, oh, I really want to be a lawyer and then I get there and then I have a breakdown and the breakdown really manifested in, in a number of different ways one of them was lots of panic attacks um, so physically being unable to move at times mm. um, unable to sleep and also just massive catastrophizing overthinking to the point that like decisions that were really easy for me before were just completely impossible um so that was that was really really tough and that was about five years ago five six years ago and if i suppose with the knowledge that i have now probably adhd has contributed to that because it does make me a bit of a workaholic i'm not gonna mm. lie <laughs> and a bit of a perfectionist i mean i completely relate to that last bit workaholic and i, I don't do you think you're driven by an insecurity or do you think you're pushed by motivation i think it's a bit of both definitely before it was insecurity i think now i found my passion and my mm. my purpose it's more around sharing that knowledge and helping people but i think when i first started out as a lawyer i definitely think it would have been around insecurity mm. and like not knowing who i was and like trying to prove myself um because I kind of felt when I was younger that I actually was always failing at stuff, even though I wasn't. Mm. Um, like looking back now, I definitely wasn't. But at the time, it felt like that. And particularly, I remember a time when um, I got all A's at GCSE and A stars, and then I was on track for three A's. So I applied for all A universities. I'm going to be a barrister. Look at me, rah, 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 you know. And then I got two B's and a C, mm. and my world just ended. And I was like, well, what do I do now? Because I didn't have a plan B. I'm not really a plan B person. <laughs> Um, and I just didn't have a plan B and mm. that that was really difficult to deal with because that rejection that I felt really hit hard. Mm. Such a common pain point within the community, that sensitivity to rejection mm. and, and one's reaction to it. Is that something you're more aware of now? Definitely. And it's something that actually until about a year ago, I wasn't really aware that it was linked to ADHD. I thought it was more me just overthinking stuff with the anxiety mm. so when you've got this interplay of mental ill health with neurodevelopmental condition like sometimes you're not sure why you do certain things um and you kind of question yourself a little bit mm. but yeah i do think yeah i do think it's, it's a huge challenge how do you deal with overwhelm oh um i'd like to say that i'm really good at dealing with but i'm going to be really honest and i'm not um i think i give an example on friday i just felt so overwhelmed I was at an event and I was sat there and lots of people coming up to me like oh Jodie you don't know me but mm. and that kind of my social battery was so low at this point and I felt really exhausted but I was at an event where I was with some of my staff and some clients and thinking I'll just get through this and honestly I felt so overwhelmed I just got I got in a taxi I left early and I just cried the whole way home because mm. I was just 
I just felt like I hadn't, didn't have any energy. I didn't have anything to give. Mm. You get to that point where you're like, yeah. <laughs> I've got nothing to give. I feel mm. like I've given everything this week. And I think that's the challenge when you are ADHD because you want to give everything. You do like gen, like you work really hard. Generally, you find that people with ADHD are really hard workers mm. and sometimes overcompensate and that leads to overwhelm. So in answer to your question, not always very good at it, but what I have been doing is I created a journal last year for myself to to help me reflect because I'm not a natural reflector on how I'm feeling mm. so physically emotionally and also helping me practice gratitude so that I don't feel so overwhelmed when I have a few things come in really quickly that might make me feel overwhelmed was actually if I'm reflecting more often I'll find that I'll focus on something positive mm. so mm. it's less overwhelming because I'm like oh, actually that those those things there are all really good it's such good advice and I think overwhelm is is such a big issue with many people with ADHD especially in the workplace and like you've alluded to it can often be because you've and perhaps because we're inherent people pleasers we say yes to too much yeah. and suddenly we've got too much to do we try and do too much and we burn out yeah with ADHD in the workplace and if someone has ADHD and they want to ask their employer about making some reasonable changes, adjustments. Mm, yeah. What's the best way to go about that? So the first thing is to know that you don't need to have a diagnosis to get support at work. So I think mm. that's really important to know. A lot of people think that you have to go to, to get the diagnosis and then you get the support. In the workplace, there isn't a legal requirement for that. You just have to show that you have a mental impairment and that it substantially impacts your ability to do your job or your day-to-day -day activity. So it doesn't have to just be your role. If you can illustrate it's impacting your sleep, it's impacting your ability to be on time, you know, think about the ways in which the challenges manifest and then explain things that the employer could do to alleviate that. And that's what would be discussed as like the reasonable adjustment. So an example might be, can I have more flexibility in terms of my start and finish times because of time blindness, for example. Mm. Um, or it might be that you actually find working from home is better because there's less distractions, less noise for certain tasks. So thinking about adjustments that might be used on an ad hoc basis, it doesn't have to be a permanent change to a fixed hour. It could be things that you need, you know, just on the day thinking actually my, my symptoms are worse today. So mm. I just need a bit more flexibility. So for me, it's, I've always say to people, don't wait for a diagnosis and, and, you know, don't be shy about asking for the help. A lot of the time, employers will want to help. But they don't really know what to do. So go with suggestions um, and, and just ask, ask what, what they, what that, you know, what are they able to do to support you? Um, the other thing that you can do is contact DWP and get um, adjustments via DWP, which is a free process where you can get physical adjustments. So for example, I got um, some ADHD coaching and I got some training on how to use iOS products to mm. help me okay. manage my ADHD. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. We'd never have thought that. Mm. So it's like using the stuff that you've already got rather than getting new stuff. And then things like noise cancelling headphones and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it's really important to ask the question and to work with your employer. So, you know, neither of you are necessarily going to know all the answers, but definitely ask the question and start the conversation. Can the adjustments start really early on, at, even at the recruitment stage? Yes, yeah. So employers aren't allowed to ask you, do you have a disability? But they can ask you, do you need any adjustments for your interview? So mm. it might be the lighting, it might be the, the, the temperature, or you might want the questions in advance so that you can prepare. Um, so yeah, again, if you feel comfortable doing that, then I would definitely request that. Because actually, think about it this way. If your employer or prospective employer is not going to give you them an interview, do we really want to work for them? <laughs> no. Do you, do you no, know what yeah. I mean? Though, yeah, like, yeah, if they're yeah. not going to be accommodating at that mm. stage, why wait to then get the job and then ask? Mm. Because you know, is that the right culture for you? Probably They've already not. given the signal that they might not be yeah. accommodating later down the line. Yeah, yeah, and then you're already in it. Yeah, is there um, an example of what might be unreasonable? So reasonableness is the area where lawyers litigate, basically. <laughs> so this is our area. Um, Yes, there are lots of things that can be unreasonable and what, how, how the tribunal look at reasonableness. So if it was to go all the way there, because you say, for example, employee says, well, they failed to make an adjustment. So now bring a claim. What the tribunal look at is the impact on the individual, whether the adjustment was something that would have alleviated the disadvantage mm, or right. at least at least a little bit. Mm. Um, and then they also look at like other things like the impact on the business, the cost. But cost can't be the only thing. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to hire your own personal assistant 
um, full time, that's probably going to not be reasonable. But there might be things that you can do where you might be able to give some of your role to other people that, or you might body double with people or, mm. you know, there might be things that you can do to adjust your role rather than getting a full time person that just does it for you or with you, for example. I suppose the obvious next question is if they speak to their employer and what happens if they refuse? What happens if they say no? So if they refuse, I'd always recommend raise a grievance so you have a paper trail then because usually these conversations are just like a chat with your manager. Mm. If if you don't get the adjustments that you want, take advice and raise the grievance because the grievance then sets out, this is what I asked for, this is when I asked for it and this is what... Um, you said when you refused it mm. what that does is adds a layer of protection to an individual so if they then suffer what's called a detriment so it might be you know you're not invited to the team drinks or you don't get that promotion then you have an extra layer of protection from discrimination there so it's called victimization so there's these two types of claims you've got reasonable adjustments and then victimization so the the, the raising of the grievance is a protected act so anything that happens after that could potentially be protected which is something that people don't always know about do people have to ensure that they're collecting evidence, proof, if the worst does happen and they feel like they've been dismissed because of their mm. disclosure, mm -hmm. then suddenly a month later they've been managed out, managed but out. actually they think that it's because of... Is that a tricky situation to prove, that it's because of that the, dis, the disclosure, disclosure? Potentially. So what I always say is keep a diary. So whenever you're mm. um, having these conversations, keep a diary because it is so easy to forget the details and the dates and what people said. Mm. It can also be used as contemporaneous evidence. So that actually could be evidence in of itself. Um, often, it is, often if there is a conversation it's in employment context, it's usually one word against another. So tribunals are used to that and they just go on who they believe. Uh, based on the on the evidence before them so if there's no written evidence they'll mm. decide whose testimony is is the most reliable mm. which is quite stressful yeah. <laughs> as a lawyer as well it's quite stressful <laughs> it's like 50 50 but if that's why it's helpful if you have got a grievance that's evidence if you have got a doctor's note or you do have a diagnosis that makes suggestions of adjustments or you could go see occupational health mm. and they might support you in terms of what adjustments might be helpful so having some form of paper trail is super important if you want to challenge it and if you raise a grievance and then it still doesn't get addressed, is that what's the escalation after that? So if you raise a grievance and it's not addressed, then you either decide, is this for me? Like, is it, is it bad enough that I can't do my job? Do I need mm. to leave? And I wouldn't suggest anyone resigns, by the way, uh, without taking advice because it is, it's a serious decision to mm. make. Um, but you don't have to leave your job to bring an employment tribunal claim. You can actually bring it whilst you're still employed for a failure to make adjustments or victimisation. So provided you do it within three months, you would approach a company called ACAS. They will then try to settle it for you. Mm. And you're essentially asking for what's called um, injury to feelings. So it's a sum of money to compensate you for the injury to feelings. Um, you could also ask for recommendations in that they have to make certain adjustments or they have to give people certain training mm. or they have to put a policy in place, which I think can have a wider impact, which I think is really helpful. And they're called recommendations. How do you like quantify injury to feelings? <laughs> This is a brilliant question. I've just written a book on it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have. Um, it's 82,000 words. Um, so the short answer is it's really complicated because it's dependent on the number of acts of discrimination and, and, and over what kind of period of time that they lasted mm. and also the personal impact on the individual. So, you know, some people, lots of things might happen, but they're like, they take it in their stride. So mm. there isn't really an impact. So the same thing might happen to someone else in a different workplace and actually the injury to feelings be much higher. So there are, there are these different bands that it would fall into. So if you've got a one-off act, it's going to be the lower band, most fall in the middle. And then the top band you have um, where people tend to have had some kind of psychiatric injury or like a lengthy campaign of harassment, for example, mm. um, or, they've or they've left their jobs because of it. Um, but yeah, it's quite complicated. So you're looking at anything from like a few thousand pounds to tens and thirties and fifties of thousands of pounds, uh, depending on the impact mm. on the individual. Obviously, if you then suffer with your mental health as a result, it's likely to be higher. So again, keep the diary and see how you feel after, um, you know, you have these conversations with your employer. Mm. It's helpful to remember how you actually felt at the time and how you feel now. Many people are struggling with the shortage of ADHD medication mm. at the moment? Is that something that people should be raising with their employers? 
Yeah, it's a really good point, actually, because employers will probably notice that one, I mean, I certainly was feeling more anxious about it, just not knowing when will I get my medication? If I do get it, will it be the right dosage? Mm. So that impacted my mental health negatively. And it also affected my concentration because I'm thinking, oh, when am I going to get my medication? And do, do I need to spend some time on the phone now ringing around every single pharmacy in the north of England? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, how do I buy it? I'm asking people, you know, to help to help out. Mm. So, so there's that side of it. But there's also the fact that if people aren't taking the medication, whether they're self-rationing or whether they just run out, it's likely that their symptoms are going to be in full, full flow, plus mm. the impact of any mental health conditions. So, uh, from an employer's perspective, I would highly recommend if you know anyone who is taking medication, or even if you're not sure, put a notice out to people to say, look, we know about the shortages. If you need extra support or you need it to talk to somebody, come to us. Because I think part of it as well, a lot of people don't talk about their medication. Mm. People don't know they're on it because they're ashamed of it or there's stigma attached. And actually, that can be a challenge in and of itself because they can't talk to someone about the medication point because mm. people don't know they're on it. So if you approach it from a respect of if anyone needs more support or adjustments come to us, then you're not then forcing people to disclose the, the medication as well. Yeah, you raised a really good point there about not perhaps wanting to raise the issue because of the shame. And I mm -hmm. suppose that also alludes to the impact of rejection sensitive dysphoria in the office and how perhaps people might not want to speak out because they're so terrified of a criticism or mm. a rejection in response. I mean, mm. Is there any tangible advice for anyone in, in that situation? Well, I suppose going back to the point about the interviews, like working for a company that like shares your values and the culture is a positive one. Mm. Uh, that's why I set my own law firm up because I was very much of the mindset that I didn't want to go and work for someone else who didn't really care about mental health or neurodiversity. So for me, that, I'm not saying everyone goes set up your own company, obviously, <laughs> but, but the reality is... Um, it's finding your tribe and finding you know a workplace mm. that, where you feel like you can have those conversations mm. because there are still places where people don't feel it's com you know comfortable and it's interesting I was at a conference last week and one of my staff was talking saying you know or she was sharing her story and she was being really open and people were like oh that's really uncommon and she's like oh it's really not but because she's worked for me for four years she's in this bubble of like that's just how we are and actually in the big world outside of our bubble it is definitely difficult for people to talk about it especially mm. when medication's involved i think um because there's still a stigma attached to well what you know are you gonna take it forever what does it do to you mm. like not understanding even that i mean when i first took medication i didn't even understand why do i need a stimulant i was like i'm hyperactive i don't need a stimulant <laughs> and when they explained the, the the science behind it i was like that makes so much sense mm. and now i get it so i think educating people and more people sharing their stories about whether it's a diagnosis or using medication or their symptoms or their adjustments, that helps in workplaces. So if leaders can do that, it's a really mm. great way to role model. If someone is brave and shares their diagnosis at work and then they feel like they're bullied mm -hmm. as a result by whoever, is it a similar process? You raise a grievance and yeah. so on? Yes, yeah, so I'd raise it informally first. Um, but all, I mean, there's no legal requirement to raise a grievance. This is more me trying to suggest best practice you can just go straight and put a claim in if mm. you wanted to but often if people are staying employed they want to try resolve it and putting a claim in kind of gets people's backs up if that's the if that's the, the first thing that the first time the employer ever hear about it but yeah similar process it could potentially be disability discrimination because adhd is likely to be a disability under the equality act mm. because it is a mental impairment and it does impact people substantially in the workplace everybody is defined under that definition that on an individual basis so i can't say adhd always is but most of the cases that i have dealt with where i'm advising on adjustments or discrimination in any in any respect for for, for adhd i found that actually it's always met the definition in the cases that i've been running so mm. you know it, it, that means that you've got that protection in the most in most cases what else do you think companies can do to make it clear that they're hands are wide open and that they really do genuinely support and want neurodiversity within their business? So I think um, training for managers is really important around how to have the conversations for reasonable adjustments. Like if one of their staff was to speak to them, do they know what to say? Mm. Because often what we find is managers become managers because they're good at what they do. They're not always great with people. And that's often where things fall. And I'm really passionate about changing that um, at the moment, I'm working with the government on some law changes because actually 
looking at the at the risk within an organization and going okay on an individual basis what does this person need rather than this kind of blanket approach mm. which you often see and then on a more wider scale like in the organization who's being trained do they have the right skill set do they know about neuro inclusive language are they you know making comments that actually could be seen as harassment because they're aimed at someone because of their ADHD symptoms mm. so it's being mindful of what we say unintentionally, which could still be discrimination. There's a real misconception that you have to have intent to discriminate against someone, and you don't. You don't. It just has to meet the definition. Mm. And there are, there are a number of different types of discrimination. We've only touched on like two or three of them today. So, you know, it's not that you don't have to have intended to offend somebody, but you might do that by virtue of ignorance or lack of education. Mm. So employers should really invest in that in that side look at their policies as well. Do you have policies that deal with reasonable adjustments? Do people know how to access them? Is it clear? Is that document accessible to people who are neurodivergent? Do they know, you know how to access it and, and, and is it in font that they can read? Um, so there's lots of different things that employers can be thinking about, but I think education and then building the foundations mm. um, through training and policies is really important. Do you have any advice for employees that, who might want to professional boundaries in place at work but perhaps aren't feeling confident to do it mm, that's all I always um, struggle with that myself people mm. pleasing yeah. <laughs> um, yes I think it is I think it's important to think about well what what are my absolute non-negotiables this is what how I do it so I go what are my non-negotiables what absolutely can I can I not take on anymore you know where's where's that line mm. and, and not crossing that and being really firm with that and backing yourself and not feeling bad because we feel so bad when we don't do all the things that we want to do or do all the things we're asked to do. But it's really important to push back on stuff and do it in advance, you know, be proactive and, and talk to people about the things that actually are beyond your capacity or beyond those boundaries. Um, because actually, if we don't do that, then how can we expect others to help us? Mm -hmm. So I think it's on us to communicate that as well, not just on employers to, to know what those are. Um, and, and one of the things we do with our team is we always ask in our one-to-ones, how is your well-being? What, um, what's, what's on your mind? And we like that's the focus of the start of our one to ones. So there's an opportunity and there's a safe space every month to talk about that, whether it's mental health, physical health, neurodiversity, whatever it is. And, you know, a lot of employers don't create the space mm. for that. So if it's an employer listening, that's something that you could look to do is to create that space. Ask that extra question when you when you see people mm. or have that space in the appraisals or the one to ones so that you've got a dedicated time where it's actually recorded. It's so interesting. I always use the example of meetings and always thinking, did, what, did that meeting need to happen? Could that have been said in an email? And if the meeting does happen and a decision needs to be made in the meeting, if it's not urgent, sort of allowing a grace period of, say, 24 hours for people to go away and then submit their ideas to the problem. Mm -hmm. Because often, I don't know about you, but if I'm in a meeting, I can often get paralysis of thought through mm. anxiety of being in a room with other people so if i'm left to have time to on my own in a safe space to think i can often come up with an amazing idea mm. but if the loudest voice in the room in that meeting was chosen as the as the answer to the problem then and i think that happens a lot yeah um, it does happen a lot do you know there's a really interesting um book called rebel ideas i don't know if you've read it um i think it's matthew side it's really great and he talks about um, diversity of thought in mm. the room and one of the things that he suggests is having those meetings where you've got the like the loudest person who speaks first or perhaps the leader always speaks first so i'm conscious that you know you have conf com confirmation bias where people might just follow what i say because i'm their boss so the loudest people or the leaders speaking last mm. as well and giving people information in advance and allowing them to submit suggestions in advance so that you accommodate all types of communication skills which in turn will be more neuroinclusive. Mm. so you're actually looking at cognitive diversity there but actually by virtue of, of how you approach it you're not going oh you're adhd so i'll do this you're actually just saying to everybody we want you to communicate in the way that's best for all of you so we do that through um, a thing called our license to thrive so <laughs> this is our like document so when you're on board at thrive you get everybody's license to thrive so 
it says mine's very detailed because I have a lot of needs. <laughs> <laughs> so they're probably reading it going, oh my God, what is this, who is this woman? But actually it manages expectations, says how I work best. If I send you a really short email, I'm not an arsehole. I'm actually mm. just in a really, really sh like short time frame, or and I, I just respond really quickly to things. Um, so if I don't put niceties, I don't hate you. Um, and, and, you know, you can talk about like, if I send an email at a stupid time and I obviously don't expect you to reply at that mm. time, it's just that I can't sleep. Um, so our license to thrives, everybody creates their own when they join and then we, we, we talk about it and then you can see other people's within your team. So mm. it's a way to help improve communication without going, well, you're ADHD, so you need this. It's talking about how do we all work best together? So it's more inclusive, more generally. You think as well, just normalizing certain behaviors, like, you know, you've turned up today with a fidget toy. You've kindly given me a, one on my wrist to play yeah. with. And I've always been that way. I was off before recording. I was saying if I'm doing something mm. with my hands, I can think a lot clearly. And yeah. a lot of people would just feel so much more comfortable if that, if someone walked into an office with a fidget toy or noise cancelling headphones on yeah. and it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, I think, especially in the legal scene, I mean, if I walked in with like a pink fidget toy and a bracelet and starts popping it and then I'm tapping and stuff, it's just, it's just not, it's not, it's so not acceptable in so mm. many places. And that's wrong because actually you're going to get the best out of me if you let me wear what I want, work where I want and, you know, play with a fidget toy mm. or, you know, have something that, um, is allowing me to move. And I, I always say in meetings as well, I, I might stand up. So I have a movable desk now because actually one of my adjustments, and I never even thought this would be a good adjustment until I went for my assessment, was to have a, a desk that moves up and down so that when I'm starting to get really fidgety, I can stand up and mm. put the energy through my body. And I actually say at the beginning of all my presentations now and my meetings, I'll say, um, by the way, guys, if I stand up or I'm fidgeting, it's not that I'm not interested. I'm just ADHD and that's how, it, that's, how I, that's how it rolls, okay? And actually just even me just sharing that with people, then they tell their team and, you know, it's, it's helpful for people to continue to share that. And, and as you say, like normalize it mm. and, you know, bring the toys in and, you know, these are adult toys, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sponsored by them, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's so true. Just movement helps yeah. so much. To create clarity of thought, little things like having a meeting. Could you, could you have a meeting walking around a park if you're mm. able to, or walking around the office? But yeah, to your point, movement, creating motion for me massively helps. Yeah, I do a lot of walking meetings. So mm. when I do calls, and, and this is why I think I prefer to live in a hot country, yeah. <laughs> because when it's warm, I'm outside, I'll take my dogs with me and mm. I'll walk for like four hours. And I have the best calls when I'm walking because I can't see my screen. I'm not um, distracted by stuff because my body's the distraction. Mm. It's, you know, the energy's flowing through my body. And I find that some of the best conversations that I have are when I'm walking, where I, I actually listen better. I listen so much better. Mm. So I find otherwise I'm, you know, something will pop up or there's, you know, I don't know, there's a book on the shelf. And I'm like, oh, have I read that one yet? <laughs> yeah, your text is just gone. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard when you get a lot of information. Like, you know, I, I appear in court and I have mm. to really pay attention and sit still when you're in court. You know, I can't bring a toy to court. Well, Maybe I can. I don't know. I've never tried <laughs> because of, because of the stigma, though. And you know, yeah. it's that kind of yeah. you know, you don't bring in pink mm. toys and play with them mm. when you're in front of a judge. So I think you know, being able to normalise some of mm. these things will help people who are neurodivergent feel more comfortable to be themselves and to work at their best. It's so interesting you mentioned the courtroom because I had a big court case a few years ago. I was on the witness box, civil case, cross-examined for six days, and I had a panic attack. On and I had to say, "Excuse me, judge, I need to." I sweated mm. it out in the bathroom, and then we carried on. But just going off tangent for a second, is there anything that the criminal justice system in that in that courtroom setting could do to be a bit more neuroinclusive? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things that, um, obviously I'm not in the criminal setting, but I'm an employment lawyer, but one of the things generally you can look to do for people who are witnesses is the lawyers can be asking, are there any adjustments that you might need? Is there anything that um, we can let the court know of before? So we deal with a lot of people who are neurodivergent or who have mental health problems. And mm. I ask that before they, they give evidence. And I will tell the judge in advance you know, this person's going to need breaks at this time or you know if, if I'm if I notice that they're starting to feel overwhelmed I'm going to ask for a break mm. um, or it might be that actually you know we split the evidence in a different way or you know, there, there are different ways that you can approach it but ideally the solicitor should be having that conversation and also that would be helpful if the courts I don't know if it's different in different courts but they do ask at the tribunal do you do you have any adjustments that you need I suppose the challenge is you might be thinking well I'm all right 
Mm. And then you have a panic attack and you're thinking, well, now I'm not all right. Yeah. So <laughs> now what do I do? Um, and it's, yeah, it's just how they deal with it. So mm. some training, I think, for the court staff is really important on how to, to deal with that, whether it's mental health first aid or some other training on the more kind of the crisis side of it. Mm. Um, but it isn't, it's not easy giving evidence anyway, you know, so when you're, when you are already struggling with anxiety or ADHD or whatever it might be, it's even more challenging to absorb all that information mm. and everyone's looking at you and you've got to get it right and you can't make a mistake. It's a lot of pressure and we're, we're the hardest on ourselves in the first place. So it's even harder when a judge or a barrister's grilling you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not surprised, yeah. All the work, amazing work you're doing now um, around ADHD, you must get frustrated when you see people say ADHD is just a trend. Oh yeah, because it's so cool to be ADHD. <laughs> like, um, yeah, no, I do get really frustrated. And I think the, the challenge is because there is more awareness, there are more people going, oh, well, you know, everyone just thinks they are. And I, and I also really don't like when people go, oh, I've got a bit of ADHD. Like, you know, I've got a bit of OCD, I've got a bit of. Like, it really irritates me, as you can tell, I'm quite, <laughs> I'm being quite vocal now, but it really irritates me. And the reason why is because it, it doesn't, you might associate yourself with one or two symptoms. Well, you know, sometimes I feel sad. I'm not depressed, mm. you know, so just because you lose your keys once in a while doesn't mean you have ADHD. And I think that the, the challenge is the lack of awareness on the actual impact of the condition because so many people dress it up as a superpower. And don't get me wrong, there are some benefits when you're in a good hyper-focused state, hyper-focusing on the right thing, not sorting out a sock drawer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, you don't, I don't think it is always you know, that amazing to have ADHD because there are some really dark times when you have ADHD, which isn't always spoken about. So mm. yeah, when, when yeah, the, obviously I think it's helpful. I do think it's helpful that there's more awareness and I don't want the awareness to drop, but I think there needs to be the same amount of education that goes with that mm. to help people understand that, yes, there are these positives and there's all these memes that say all these fantastic things that you've got, but equally we don't want to invalidate the difficulties that people have because often you find as well, I don't know anyone that's got ADHD that hasn't also got a mental health problem, for example. So you're balancing two conditions at least. Mm. And that's really, that's really difficult. And I don't like that that can be invalidated by comments that are made quite flippantly. Mm. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. There's so many comorbidities with ADHD, noticeably anxiety. Mm. And just going back to ADHD in the workplace for a thing, do you think there's a benefit for managers to also be trained on actually just recognizing what anxiety looks like? Definitely. I'm a huge advocate. So when I set my firm up five years ago, the reason I set it up, as I said, I had a breakdown. And what I wanted to do was create a psychologically, psychologically safe place mm. for me to work. And what that meant was educating people around me. So the people that come into my team are all trained on mental health first aid. They're all trained on how to have conversations and spot it in each other and mm. have these open conversations. And I think more businesses would benefit from that if they took the time to think about well, actually, you know, if, if we could spot the signs in each other, imagine where you do, it doesn't escalate all the way to now you're being disciplined, now you're um, you know, being performance managed. Mm. It's actually, we're gonna nip this in the bud. We've, I've spotted some signs. An example I've got at the moment, I'm coaching one of my staff and she's um, spoken openly about her anxiety and was featured in the ACAS guidance on the adjustments that we made for her. But what was really interesting hearing her speak was the fact that because I spoke about my anxiety, she felt she could come to her interview and tell me on the way she had a panic attack in the interview. Mm. She's like, I would never have been able to do that before. So I do think it starts with the, with the top. And one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is becoming a coach and not because I'm going to be everybody's coach, because I want to be able to coach my team through their difficult times. So they have access to therapy and counseling and all of that. But this is more about on the job when they're, when I spot their behaviors are changing and like that, I can see that that's anxiety because mm. I know this person really well and it's building those relationships and building that knowledge. And I think as leaders, like we have an obligation to do that because we are the people who can affect real change in the workplaces. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think of like the amount of lost hours of productivity and unhappiness that must be a result of ADHD or other neurodivergent manifesting into anxiety. Mm. I think, you know, if someone's saying yes to everything, that might be a sign of anxiety. If someone's yeah. more fidgety than normal, that might be a sign of anxiety. Yeah. Do you think there's any 
other signs that might be a, a, a clear indicator that someone might be struggling behind that desk? Yeah, so I think communication changes. So often what I look out for is a, is a change in behavior. So if somebody becomes more fidgety or less fidgety, if someone becomes louder or quieter, mm. if someone puts their camera on less or more, like and the same mm. with socializing, if they're becoming more withdrawn, um, so I often focus on like the change in the behavior and whether I think that could be attributable to mm. something. I'm obviously not diagnosing everybody all around the world, but actually if you, if you get to know people, you'll notice when those things change and when people's communication changes. So an example might be some people might get more controlling over their work mm. because they're like, I don't really trust people. I'm really anxious at the minute. I'm just going to do it myself because it's easier because they won't delegate. For example, we see this a lot in the employment context and that then that's, their, that's the way that their anxiety is manifesting rather than actually them going, okay, so I need to talk to someone about this. It's a, It'll manifest in different ways, which looks like they're being really difficult, mm. looks like they're being controlling, looks like they're not being fair, but actually it's their way of coping. So if we can spot those things and deal with them in a, a kind and a fair way rather than going, well, that was really uncalled for, so now you need to be disciplined, that's just going to make people feel more anxious. Mm. I think sometimes people forget there's a human in this process. Like, you know, we're talking about different claims and different, you know, adjustments and things. But actually, it's a human being. Like, ask them what they want. Ask them how you can help them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Super helpful. What, what do you say to people who... So, some people with ADHD often get labelled too much or too intense. Me. <laughs> what do you say to people who say that? Um, so I actually used to be really ashamed of that. I used to cry. I used to be like, I am too much, like no one will love me. I actually used to feel like that a lot. And I found that actually having had the diagnosis, that's allowed me to accept myself more. And now I'm like, well, if I'm too much, then go somewhere else. Because I didn't used to have that mindset. I used to be, I used to feel really upset at partly, I suppose, cause you feel rejected mm. as well. Feeds back into the RSD, you know, that constant feeling of rejection and that you're not good enough. But like, I'm not good enough, but I'm also too much. Like, I can't win. Like, somebody, give me a break. Yeah. And that's the reality. And, and I get told all the time, I'm so intense and I'm too much and I'm too this, I'm too that. But actually, the, the group of people that I work with don't think that because they accept me for who I am. So surrounding yourself with people who accept you for who you are is so important because they're not judging me. They actually, they, they, they like my quirks, I think. They're probably all like, <laughs> going, well, you don't like them all. But the reality being like, you know, we're all gonna annoy, annoy each other at some point, but I think like labeling people as too much or too loud or too this, like, you're just trying to dim their light. And I just think that's, it's not, it's not a helpful thing to say to people. Mm. I've, it, I find it really triggering when people say that. 100% relate and agree. If every time you, tell someone they're too much you're just hammering them into this confinement mm. this constraint of, of like their... a mold that they have to become part of in society that's like but who creates that mold like yeah. what are we trying to too much for what who what what's the level like mm. there's no i don't know it's just this kind of this is how normal it is well, what is normal mm. if you could go back in time what would you tell yourself pre-diagnosis I'd tell myself to be kinder to myself. I think I was really, really hard on myself, definitely internally and just how much I pushed myself through things when actually I could have just taken a break or, you know, it didn't really need to happen that day. I could do it the next day. So almost, yeah, pu almost punishing myself sometimes for not being good enough. Mm -hmm. And if I could go back, just be kinder at each of those stages and then, you know, maybe I wouldn't have had the breakdown. Who knows? What's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Oh God. Okay. Well, um, did just get a tattoo in, in Morocco. Another one. Oh, yeah, I've got tass? loads of tattoos. Um, I've got a little, it's a little surf thing here. You probably, oh, yeah, it's cool. basically yeah, yeah. a tiny okay. little, um, wave. And we literally Googled it. Didn't even research it, went mm. in and I was going to get this huge heart chakra thing and then we didn't have time. So I was like, I'll oh, just chuck a wave on there. <laughs> and I did it with my co-author who's also a barrister. So it's not very, um, it's not very loyally like I don't think, but I've got quite a lot of tattoos and some of them, mm. well, they all, they all have part of my, the all part of my journey, but also some of them I've literally just gone in on the day and been like, 
I'm going to just have that here. And I've got a huge <laughs> one here. And everyone's like, what? Where, what? Why did you get that? I was like, I just, you know, just like lions. They're like, but it's huge. <laughs> um, and then also travel. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm the friend that you need to message if you just want to book a flight tomorrow. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and if my diary's not so busy, it's quite busy at the minute. But I, I booked last year, was it last year, year before? Um, like the week before, maybe, maybe not even the week before, two days before I flew, mm. just before Christmas, like the day before Boxing Day, sorry, day before Christmas Eve. And I flew to Thailand for three weeks, didn't even book a hotel, just flew. Just went. Just went. <laughs> um, and then and then I had an overwhelming like sense of fear because I was like, oh God, I've booked the flight and I'm on the flight and I've only got one hotel book. Right, and now I need to sort everything because I used to be such a, um, a stickler for like making sure everything was planned. Mm. But... Um, with, with travel, because now I work for myself, obviously you don't need to book holidays. So it kind of creates this very impulsive part, mm. um, yeah, part of me that just likes to fly everywhere. <laughs> it's great though, I've seen some great countries. <laughs> and because we can be great in a crisis, you, you sorted it all out. Yeah, 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 literally. That, that's a really good point about being great in a crisis, by the way, mm. um, because people always go to me, how can you, how can you not just fill this form in to, and do this task? It's really easy. But when we went into a national lockdown, you managed to save the business. You didn't even get paid. You did this, 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 and this, but you can't fill that form. And that's really simple. I'm like, that's ADHD right mm. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Have you got any advice for people who keep on forgetting to take the wet laundry out of the washing machine? Um, so if you can get a cleaner, <laughs> yeah, <that helps. laughs> um, I, I'm actually horrendous at this. Um, oh God, the amount of times that it smells. Yeah, oh my God. I did it twice last week. Uh, honestly, I mean, f I must use like three times as many tabs because yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly going on. ADHD tax coming yeah, in there. Yeah, the ADHD tax is real. Um, yeah, I would, I actually have a cleaner now because, um, it is a real challenge. I'm mm. fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, and I, I also live with my friend and I'm always, and I always say to her, right, I've put the washing in by mm. the way. So then she helps me remember to get things out. Um, great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do, do you think, what, what do you say when, when you hear people say ADHD is a superpower? I'm in two minds about it because I, I appreciate that there are some, you know, incredible parts of ADHD, ADHD in terms of like hyper focus and being able, being able to like deal mm. with the crisis, for example. But I, I'm, it goes back to the point about invalidating the difficulties. I, I struggle with the word with saying that ADHD is generally a superpower because I don't think it is. Um, but equally, I think it's important to celebrate the strengths that we have when mm. we are ADHD. Yeah, totally agree. Jodie, this has been so much fun. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you.